All right, to start off tonight, um, we have several different information presentations, and the first one being uh, the student access to instructional technology um, led by uh, Reed Alliance. Good evening on a nice cold evening. Hope you had a warm day somewhere inside today. Um, last month in December, I think someone mentioned on the board, where are we with a recommendation on increasing our student access uh, at the middle level? And so we are here tonight to bring you um, our proposal on that. We'll be coming back in February for a vote on this. Connie Smith has really led this project with our technology action plans. And so I'm just going to turn it right over to her and let her get started on this. Thank you. As Rita mentioned, we've been involved in a year-long study at the middle school level in an effort to identify the type of technology needed that would truly make an impact on student engagement, learning, and achievement. We've investigated multiple devices and peripherals in both the core and non-core academic areas and are ready to make a recommendation this evening. Tonight it's with unanimous agreement from our TAPS teachers involved in the process and consensus from all of our middle school principals that we are proposing a solution which we believe will increase for all, all our middle school students, their engagement in all academic content areas, increase the breadth and scope of their educational opportunities, and provide equity of access for students regardless of the school building they attend or the technology available to them at home. The decision of the TAPS teachers agreed upon by middle school principals is the request for the board to approve a one-to-one -one iPad deployment at all nine middle schools, impacting all students and staff at this level. With many different device types and versions of those devices, the TAP staff wish to provide the rationale, rationale for the choice of the iPad. Our teachers really believe the iPad provides all of the major components of a laptop that students have been used to, plus it provides added value and unmatched features from any other device. It encourages the building of technical skills uh, to include capturing and editing of photo and video. It includes uh, students' communication skills being increased as unique opportunities for expanding both their oral and written skills via new ways to present their learning. Creativity and confidence uh, are built as interaction with the new media uh, that is unique to the iPad's features, provides, and makes possible. The iPad also provides the benefit of 24-7 access to digital content to include interactive textbooks and resources not otherwise available to students both in the classroom and once they leave the classroom. As you know, once print media is published, it is immediately out of date. The iPad also provides both teachers and students the capability of creating new types of learning materials via apps and content creation programs. Additionally, the iPad prepares students for the future by infusing their learning with the types of technology that will, they will encounter once they graduate and, and uh, join the workplace. The interactivity features of the device uh, allow students immediate feedback and also allows teachers the ability to track for differentiation of content when applicable. The engagement factor with hundreds of thousands of free apps to support learning is unmatched with any other type of device and is very much suited for the middle school student. And finally, the portability of the device uh, achieves the district's goal identified in the 2013 bond of increasing equity and access to technology and allows for student learning in ways not currently possible. We have seen a shared excitement and agreement by all of our TAP staff for this proposal to the board as the iPad provides opportunities to engage students in cross-curricular learning activities in both core and non-core academic areas. As mentioned before, we've had the opportunity to expand involvement this semester to all nine middle schools to ensure consensus and to be sure we get it right. Dr. Rod Smith, principal at Frontier Trail Middle School, is here this evening representing our middle school principals and TAPS teachers, and he is going to share some of the excitement that he's witnessed with the involvement of several of his teachers this past uh, year. 
First of all, thank you for uh, letting me represent on behalf of the nine middle school principals. And um, as Connie said, we've had some great discussion this last year about how to best use devices to support teaching and learning. And as she said, FT is one of the pilot schools. So I'm just gonna sh uh, just quickly go through some examples of some things that um, I've been able to see uh, uh, through walkthroughs in the building and actually participate in, which has been really fun with the iPads. One of the first examples is in foreign language. Our Span Spanish teachers have been using uh, an app that's um, one that most of us, I'm sure, have heard of or used through iBook. And the students use iBook to um, write their stories in Spanish and then they present them to the class and then the class um, is learning the vocabulary as those lessons are being presented. One that I really like is in French. Um, it's an app I'm not familiar with, but uh, it's called Duolingo. And it's much like uh, the French teacher said, the best way to, to think of it, it's kind of like some of the Rosetta Stone uh, commercials you see and, and how that kind of works. Um, Duolingo allows the students to take the iPad and it, uh, the word is spoken to them and then they have to write it correctly in French. Um, both, of our, uh, both of the foreign language teachers at FT um, talked to me about uh, Connie's comment about portability and we don't have a language lab in the middle schools but if students had an iPad or device that would be something they could do in the classroom as well. Kind of an interesting thing happened on Tuesday. I had a science teacher send me an email and said, hey, um, I'm really excited about Monday's professional development, <coughs> some things I learned. Um, how soon would we have a device, an iPad, something like that, so we can do some things in science? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, that's something we're considering. Um, and this is a teacher who also has been asked me the last couple of years. She, uh, a couple of times a year, does stargazing with the community, brings the parents up and the students from Frontier Trail, and they meet out on the lawn and set up the telescopes and look at stars. She's been after me for two years saying, boy, it'd be really cool if I had an iPad to do some of the <laughs> neat apps that you could do with stargazing. So that, that's just a real current example. Um, we were, uh, this is going just off just a bit uh, on what Connie has up there with science, uh, social science, foreign language and vocal music. We were blessed to get um, an, uh, pub, a Latham Public Schools Foundation grant and this was for our library and what we noticed in our library is our biographies um, were um, becoming quite antiquated <laughs> and one of the ways we address that is through ebooks and iPads and so the foundation gave us some iPads and instead of buying full collections of books biographies that our students would be reading we're able to do that download on those um, iPads and students could access it that way and so I think that's been really good to see in the library and then this is one that I participated in and I had a lot of fun with. In social studies, you know, they're always doing current events and um, it can be a sit and get where the teacher or student comes up to the front of the class, shares their current event, and that's kind of the end of it. Well, um, I went in recently, I iPads were distributed and what we did, there's a program much like Twitter, it's called Today's Meet. And we each were assigned an iPad, including me. We had two minutes to read it and then just like a blog, we started firing uh, what we learned about that current event and it was going up on the screen as each student in my group, including myself, uh, shared about that current event. And it was really, really engaging. It was really fun. Um, the group I was in, we switched current events and wrote about that one. Um, but that was one other example. And then I'll just kind of finish with what I think is a really good quote. Um, and this was shared by one of my teachers who's been involved in the TAPS program. She said, the reality of using the one-to-one -one device is contingent on staff development and knowing that everything is not going to work out perfectly at first and not being afraid to let the students help each other and the teacher. She <laughs> talked a lot about that, how much the kids help her. As a teacher, you start small, you try different things, and before you know it, the students are working through lessons in half the time. Why? Because they're in charge of their learning and the sky is the limit when they're motivated by using a device that belongs to them. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Uh, so in conclusion, we are bringing this report to you tonight to consider um, to approve uh, at next month's board meeting for a one-to-one -one iPad deployment at all nine middle schools. Should you approve next month, we would plan to begin to deploy devices to and provide training and professional development to our staff beginning late spring and subsequently provide in-depth training uh, infused at uh, summer conference this uh, June and throughout the summer months. This would be followed by a fall 2015 student device deployment 
and a thorough and continued plan, of course, for staff and student training and professional development throughout the school year. And we would be happy to address any questions you might have at this time. I do have a few questions. So when, when we first, number one, I'm very excited about this and, and very excited about the one-on-one -on -one, um, and every student having a chance to have a, a, um, an iPad. When we first started looking at this, there were several different devices we looked at. I, I know you looked at iPads and I think you looked at surfaces and was there other ones above and beyond that? We also, also looked at a lightweight, uh, new lightweight HP uh, laptop. Okay. And um, that has, it's, it's a much improved laptop, longer battery life, um, quicker in on, on um, almost an instant on really for that laptop, but it's still a laptop. Right. And so it's the features and functionalities that are provided on the iPad that the uh, staff that really felt like that was kind of the pushing them over the edge to, to the iPad as the uh, device of choice. Okay. With that, <clears throat> you know, one of the things we had talked about initially was with the iPads, you get to do a lot more uh, visual <coughs> and animation and all that. But we we're talking about in the middle school level, they're going to write more papers, do things such as that. Can you talk to a little bit about, you know, that's where I thought Surface was going to be swayed a little bit versus an iPad. Yeah. Are they going to have all that same functionality that they would have That was definitely before? a concern, and um, Rita's passing my iPad around actually right now. It's connected to, um, through the lightning adapter, to a keyboard, which would be one of the pieces of, of the solution that we will be uh, requesting. Uh, those keyboards would be a classroom set in all of our English language arts classrooms um, so that the, the feature of a laptop is not lost uh, with the, the device inside of a, a language arts classroom. And then we're also taking a look at uh, how many other areas we might need to have a, a classroom set in or a shared department set of those uh, devices. You're welcome to, to type on that. It, it very much gives you a feel of a laptop. Um, it connects, like I said, with the adapter, so there's not the Bluetooth complexity for <coughs> middle school students to have to, uh, to deal with and that kind of cumbersome type of thing. So the different softwares like Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Uh, another, all... another thing that's really a wonderful thing that has just been uh, announced with Microsoft is our ability to provide to all of our students and staff, as a matter of fact, uh, Office 365, which allows them um, that industry standard software uh, on the iPad, as well as installing it on up to five devices at home as well. So they will have the ability to uh, use the same software as if it was on a Surface tablet or a, or a laptop as well. And saving to the cloud, so they would have access to those files uh, at home as well. And that, would, that was one of the other questions. So the information that they're going to have on here, they're going to have access to it when they go home, if they have an iPad at home or any other kind of device at home, they'll still have access to all of that? Absolutely. Okay. And they will be taking these devices home. Oh, they will. Oh, they will. So that was kind of a question. So are these assigned at the classroom level, or are they assigned to a student? Student level. Okay. So they'll be walking around in the in the hallways and everything with their iPads going they forward will. and assigned to Securely it. Securely inside of a case. Okay. Yeah, you, yes. might, you might notice the case that's on that particular iPad. Mm -hmm. That's the case that we purchased for the student iPad. And as of today, I can tell you we have not had one student iPad broken. And that, that really says a lot about the case that you purchase for them. That does add a little bit of cost to the project, well worth it. And one of the reasons we, we really encourage the taking of them home is that addresses the equity access for students that don't have that technology at home or have to share it with three or four other siblings at home. Um, so that's one of the, the main reasons why we really, really are excited about that possibility. You know, the other nice thing about an iPad is so many of the apps, while you download them for the inter from the internet, you don't necessarily have to have an internet connection to run the app once mm -hmm. it's on the device. Mm -hmm. So those students that don't have internet access at home, they still have the ability to use the tools and the apps that are on the iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, so that also kind of levels the playing field a bit. Okay. And if this is approved, sorry, if this is approved next month, when is the rollout? For staff, it would be in May, and 
leading up to summer conference so we could have some really um, a wide breadth and scope of professional development that's offered. We already have um, lots of Apple trainers that are going to be on site um, through the elementary deployment. We would add to that and increase um, the availability at summer conference for our staff as well as uh, summer training and, and PD. And then the student devices would be deployed in the fall, in August. Will students pay a fee much like they would when they check out a, a book for the for the we're discussing life several of the options year. that uh, options um, that way and with business and finance and John and um, haven't reached a conclusion yet on how that will be addressed. Okay, we'll kind of let John lead that uh -huh. uh, decision. <laughs> <laughs> We have, we have neighboring districts who have one-to-one -one initiatives. I'm sure we can uh, look at how they're doing it and see how successful yes. they've been. There's many, many examples and about as many different ways as you can do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure we'll come up with the best one. Yeah. I wanted to publicly thank Connie Smith for leading us through this project in the last 18 months. Our middle school principals have done a phenomenal job get, helping with the TAPS and getting out in the classrooms, giving us feedback. So we really appreciate everything that they've done. We're very excited to be at this point. So we'll be back with you in February. Great. Rod, I have a quick question. Yep. Uh, what, you know, we talk about the excitement of the interaction of the students and everything. What else is there on the other end of it as far as the teachers, as far as, you know, grading? Uh, you know, what other, how else are they using it on the other end of, you know, the actually, unseen end of it? Actually, one of, the, one of the things I had, the same teacher, I read the quote at the end, and I just didn't share it tonight because I didn't want to be too long, but she, um, with parent view and teacher view and student view, you know, we have all the kids now using student view. And one of the things she loves about the iPads and this would, could be the norm, is when the kids first sit down and start their bell work, um, she has them right away just look at missing assignments and check their grade. Um, so that's one, one way. And then I've seen teachers um, taking them into team meetings. And um, it's back to Connie's you know, comment. It's about the student, but the teachers are also thrilled about the portability. So they're sitting in team meetings now, and they're looking at um, things on teacher view, whether it's you know whatever data they need to pull up they're able to do that and it's quick and um is that what you're asking or is yeah yeah, yeah. staff wise i think it's one of the other things i said you know it's it'll take the training to use them and All right. thank you yep. Great. well thank you rod um connie and rita so i guess one last thing so we got the elementaries out getting ready to do middle school mm -hmm. i know we haven't got this rolled out <laughs> i know what your question and ideas is <laughs> of bring your own device to the high schools when we're going to be better prepared for that we have a meeting scheduled with our high school taps teachers uh, in february and so we will be meeting with them to garner uh, how that is going at the high school level and um, take a look at whether they need more information more time that kind of thing and and be ready to uh, move on that as soon as, as soon as we can I guess I did have one more question I thought about. So students that have an iPad at home, are they going to be allowed to bring that in or are they going to be assigned this one? They would be assigned this one. Uh, there's many reasons for that. Um, any of the apps that we have um, that we need to, we would, we're using a mobile device management system to push those out to our, uh, each of the individual iPads for students as well as, you know, just the standard um, Wi-Fi connection that it needs to be a device that is recognized by our district as a district-owned device uh, in order for it to access the full bandwidth of our of our network. So there's many other reasons for that too. Okay. Great. Anything else? Thank you. All right. Next up on the agenda is the uh, 21st Century High School expansion. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about the expansion, the opportunities that we've had first semester and will continue second semester as we develop these two new 21st century programs. Certainly our vision statement in the school district, students prepared for their future. And we do that as we are helping students go through their elementary program, their middle school program, their high school program in order to be prepared for post-secondary and careers. 
And as you look at it, probably our pinnacle, if you will, of educational opportunity is at the high school level. We have four wonderful high schools in this district. And so we're very excited about that. You know, you think about it, we have wonderful comprehensive programs. We have, uh, we have a plethora of content areas. We have advanced programs. We have remedial programs. We have fine arts. We have athletics and activities. But we had determined as a school district that our students take many different paths as they're going through their high school career and eventually to the post-secondary and their careers. So with that, we also have some select programs that are in select high schools, and those are our 21st century programs. In addition, we have our advanced technical center programs. Let's focus just for a minute, if we will, on the 21st century programs. We currently have 11 of those programs uh, throughout the district, and it's quite exciting to see that uh, plethora of classes that we have opportunities for our students. And of course, these are transfer programs, and they are only at select high schools. But we also know that while we have currently four high schools, we're about to unveil our fifth high school, 2017. You had the opportunity to do that little groundbreaking. And so with that, we are going to be adding two new additional 21st century programs at Olathe West, public safety and green technology. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of those two particular programs. I've had the wonderful opportunity to work uh, with this uh, development for these programs. We began on September the 22nd, and these are just pictures of people that were around the table. I want you to know that we had over 90 individuals sardined, I was going to say crowded, crowded in this room. We had individuals representing the city of Olathe. We had the chief of police. We had the chief of the fire department. We had assistant city manager. We had individuals from uh, federal and county government, uh, EPA, city water, uh, county water. We had individuals from higher education, JCCC, KU, et cetera. We had individuals from the State Department. We had individuals from businesses, Black and Veatch and Burns and McDonald and Kewell Power. We had individuals from our architectural firm that were very intricately involved in this opportunity. We had our administrators. We had our district staff. We had wonderful teachers, coordinators, facilitators. It was amazing to watch the, the energy in this particular room. I'd like to take just a moment because some of those individuals uh, are represented here this evening. So would anybody stand that was on our 21st Century Enhancement Expansion Program? Please stand. Ah, I want to thank them. are very important to our process. On September the 22nd was our very first meeting in this room. We had an opportunity, first of all, to do a little uh, memory walk, if you will, a historical review of why we have the 21st century programs and how they were developed. We did a little piece on that, uh, being the historian these days. Uh, we also then had an opportunity to share a vision of what Olathe West was going to be like, because we knew it was very important for folks to get an idea of the whole building before we started building those two specialty programs. And we are very fortunate to have with us architectural representation. Uh, Taryn Kinney and Rachel Schneider were able to be here. I also planned with Christian Owens, long distance to Texas. And they were here that evening to give a glimmer of what Olathe West is going to be like and all the features that we have put, uh, built into that particular school. So that was very exciting. In addition, after we had the opportunity on September 22nd to have the vision, we knew that we needed to go into the next phase, which I called phase one and that was the program shell, if you will. At these, we had two opportunities. We had two half days on which you can see all the things that we were able to accomplish in those two half days. Uh, everything from introductions and making sure we knew who was in the room, why these programs, a little bit of a mind stretch, and uh, all the way up to post-secondary opportunities and experiences. Let me walk you through just a few of those pieces. First of all, we explained why we had these two programs. Why did we come up with public safety and green technology? We went through a little bit of the process and talked about the fact that we looked at labor research, for example. We looked at our partners in the community and the needs in the community. We had lots of possibilities that we could come up with, but we ended up with public safety and green technology, feel, feeling that it would fill a hole for what we are uh, opportunities we have for our students, but also would help to meet both labor statistics as well as our community needs. 
Uh, we had lots of criteria for making sure when we picked programs, of course, student interest, and you notice I put that twice, student interest at the top and student interest at the bottom uh, because of our uniqueness of our 21st century programs. We also shared what our criteria was that we were building a 21st century program around. We wanted to make sure we had specialized coursework, and that's why we have it only at a select high school. We wanted to make sure we had extension opportunities for students, that we had uh, an opportunity to have advisory councils, all those pieces that create 21st century programs. We also did a little bit of reminder, and the one I always like to talk about is our, that our programs are unique. They are four-year high school programs. They are not just taking a course or a couple of courses. They're not just at the junior, senior year. Our 21st century programs are transfer programs, and they are for a comprehensive opportunity that 9-12 year. So that, you know, wanted to make sure that we had that in my, our mind as we built our programs. The very first thing that we had an opportunity to do as well was to kind of stretch our minds because we all came from different perspectives. We all came from different orientations and we wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity. So we read articles, we had a lot of information, and we watched some videos. I'm going to have us watch just a moment of a video, if we could. Uh, we'll see how this works out, obviously. And here was a program that we were able to discover, a green technology program that happens to be in California, that was one of the things that we're looking at to make sure that we're looking at what other people have developed and what could we uh, take that would be wonderful for our program. So just a moment of watching a program. As high school students, we get a lot of assignments, but rarely do we get an assignment that affects people halfway around the world. Students at this high school got the opportunity to do just that, and it fits inside a suitcase. Let's head inside to find out more about it. At Laguna Creek High School in Elk Grove, California, this classroom looks more like a workshop. Very heavy power tools. The saw, the drill, a nail gun, a lot of dangerous stuff. And what kind of class requires hard hats and safety goggles? Uh, it's called GETA, stands for Green Energy Technology Academy. It involves a lot of like, solar stuff, working with solar panels, wind turbines. And we're building solar suitcases. One of the pieces we're gonna build today, I'll walk you through it, is this, this support piece right here, all right? When this is in the case, it keeps the, the uh, components protected. See all the wiring here? Eric Johnson is the coordinator and instructor for the Green Energy Technology Academy. The other thing I wanna show you is actually how to start drilling the holes correctly on the component, the component board here. Really the way it works, it starts with the sun, and with the radiant energy of the sun, it's collected by the solar panel, that turns into electrical energy, and then we interface the panels with the system through this plug in this outlet right here. Once the energy comes into the system, it runs to the charge controller, and then it runs out to the battery to be stored. Like other suitcases, this one is well packed, but not with clothes and a toothbrush. Oh, very cool. And so this is a 15-foot cord. You can imagine in the middle of a hut, you just have this hanging, that's, that's lighting the entire hut. A hut? That's right, these suitcases travel a long way. So that just gives you a little piece of a glimmer and that's one of our mind stretching opportunities that we went through to make sure that we were looking at some other programs and other possibilities out there to just stretch our mind. So we did that both in law enforcement, fire safety, public safety, and in green technology. <clears throat> what we ended up with was we're going to have two strands in our public safety area. It's going to be fire safety and law enforcement uh, will be our two strands. Students will by their sophomore year select one of those strands. after an introductory year in their freshman year. In the green technology area, we ended up with two strands as well, energy and power and ecology and sustainability were our two areas there. Uh, however, students in the green technology, at least at this time, will be doing both of these areas, so they'll get a wide breadth of green technology. As we went through, of course, we brainstormed careers, and that was quite an interesting opportunity. My gosh, there's a lot of careers that these paths will lead to. An opportunity to look at, for example, that you could have anything from a parking, lot, a parking enforcement officer all the way up to someone that is going to get a criminal justice degree. So again, those paths, those multiple paths that we have for our students. We brainstormed post-secondary paths and certifications, certifications that you could earn possibly uh, as 
as you're a student, uh, those a little bit difficult because some of those have some age requirements. For example, you have to be 18 to get it, but we know that our students will have an opportunity to get some of those certifications and also certifications that they would get later on. And of course, those post-secondary paths. Here was one from Green Technology. It was kind of interesting. Oh my gosh, it's just an opening up world and opportunities in different paths and certifications that you can get in this particular area, very broad area actually. We also brainstorm partners. Oh my gosh, it was amazing the different partnerships that were starting to come out of the conversations and the activities that our students could participate in and be involved in. It was great. We also looked at advisory council. Every one of our 21st century programs, it will have an advisory <coughs> council. So we wanted to make sure that we have individuals that we can tap for that experience as well. And we were able to do that. We then began talking about coursework. Okay, what are we going to have? What's the freshman going to take? And what's a sophomore and a junior and a senior are going to take and that was quite an activity uh, we started out with a really clean little chart and for example this is green technology same thing in public safety uh, then we started messing with it and we came up with all these coursework actually our students would have to go 365 days a year seven uh, hours a day just in these areas we had more than we uh, could deal with, but we were able to cull those down. And again, a lot of messiness uh, as we went through our different coursework that our students would participate in. We also looked at building and resource needs, and we knew where, uh, we had heard already from the architects where these programs would be located, but we knew there might be some special things that we needed to consider either for building or facility needs, not too late to get that in, and of course, like I said, we had architects at all of our meetings, and as well as resources that we might need. We, uh, gosh, amazing, the things that we might need, like those little red suits for technical defensive training uh, and different uh, things for our solar panels. Uh, we also talked about there were things we were not going to be purchasing, and we did not need to worry about those, so some people got very excited about some of those uh, pieces. We then ended, if you can imagine, these, all this information that we got in these two half days, as well as the introductory session on September 22nd, we ended with elevator speeches. And uh, it was political time, maybe we should have called them stump speeches. But an opportunity for someone to, here's a father and a daughter that got in an elevator, fake elevator, of course, and someone that would just happen to get in that elevator with them and be able to say in a few minutes, what is it about this program that might be exciting? So we're going to have an opportunity to listen to just a little bit of a, an elevator speech created very quickly, an opportunity, and this is obviously someone from the public safety side. You're about the uh, local safety or 21st program, central program at the Lake of West? Yeah. I would love to hear sure. about it. Sure, all right, where are you guys going? I'm working on 481. 481? 81. 81? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only going to 406, so. <laughs> Well, the uh, 21st Century Program is, is an, a, a comprehensive program that's going to give you some exposure to both uh, law enforcement and fire safety, and, and obviously it's going to prepare you. To be, I want to be a police. You want to be a police officer? That's a, a great profession. It's a career you can be proud of. <laughs> Nothing against my, my firefighter brothers, they do a great job too, but you know, obviously you'll, you'll be able to have a, an opportunity to be exposed to both fire safety and, 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 public, and uh, police officers in, in, in the program. So that's just a little glimmer, and it was quite exciting, uh, the enthusiasm people were able to exude on this little elevator speech uh, for these, these 21st century programs, the shell of which they were creating. And again, I really, a lot of kudos to the folks who sat around. It's difficult work actually creating programs because you don't always agree, you have to come to consensus, and you're moving rather rapidly. So it was a great opportunity. But of course, you know, that was really just the beginning, and now we will go into to the next, oh, in addition, we've had some additional meetings, and I have to thank uh, the individuals who have participated in this. For example, we've had one meeting with our fire department representatives, uh, and that was great with the architects and with some our CFO and our uh, Dr. Barry and Greg Thomason to make sure are there things that we need to consider uh, that I knew nothing about fire hydrants. I've learned about fire hydrants and ladders and all kinds of things. 
Uh, we're going to have a follow-up meeting after the architects went back and did some things. We're actually also going to meet with our police department to make sure there is there anything in the facilities uh, that we need to take into consideration at this point. And then, uh, as I said, we've really had great representation mm -hmm. on our green technology, and we'll be meeting with those as well. So we have lots of things that we'll have some additional meetings related to the facility and resource needs. But now we need to go into phase two, and that is the course and curriculum development. Again, the next exciting phase as we continue to peel this, this onion that we have here. Uh, we're going to be looking at our course development, and we have a team of people in both areas that have already volunteered thank you, uh, that will be coming together. In fact, our very first meeting will be on public safety, and that will be next Wednesday. Uh, half day again uh, working on that. And we'll be working and creating some courses. For example, the introductory to public safety. What does that look like for a freshman? What are we going to include in the courses for law enforcement one and law enforcement two, fire safety one and fire safety two? Uh, we're doing a course called Spanish for First Responders. And uh, we have some individuals that we're working on that, very excited about that. Uh, uh, very, people in the field are very excited for us to take that on as an element that we would have here. In green technology, we will also be working on that. We'll be developing courses like the investigations in green technology, energy and power, and economics class, uh, which we know is very important when you relate to green technology. There's a lot of economic questions related to, to that piece as well. So again, very excited about the next phase that we'll be going through. A lot of thank you to lots of people from the board for having a vision that we would expand our 21st century programs. and because we're really looking at the future, and our future is ahead. Those sixth graders today have an opportunity to join in our programs here at Olathe West, and won't that be exciting? I've already had some connection from people that are thinking that their children will be going to these programs. So it's exciting, and we need to finish developing them so we're ready for them. We're really visioning the future, and that's really what our 21st century programs are, uh, certainly innovating for today and for tomorrow. So that's just a quick update about where we are at in the development process. I stand for any questions. Good job. Well, thank you very much. That's very informative. It's, uh, it's exciting to see us to continue to expand and, and open up some additional opportunities. I guess I didn't do the math thinking that they are the sixth graders, but they are the sixth graders today are going to be the ones who are going to be able to be the first ones um, to start some of these programs. So that is exciting. I think it's going to be great and a op great opportunity for our community as well. There's going to be great partnerships that are developing out of this and can't wait to get those kids and have an op these opportunities. It'll be wonderful for our students. Will some of the courses, um, Dr. Banikowski, require training that certified staff either in, in science or the social sciences would not necessarily have? We might have some, uh, especially, if you will, in the law enforcement and uh, one and two and our fire safety. Uh, we've certainly been at the table with uh, individuals who teach these courses at uh, JCCC, okay. but they are also professional fire people and uh, uh, law enforcement folks. But we've had Jim Payne at the table as well, so they could start looking at what are some of our certification issues that we might deal with. And um, we really have been opened up at the State Department for some of our certifications, so I think there is going to be some good possibilities. There obviously is going to need to be training. I'm really excited about our physical education and health class uh, that will be uh, particularly for public safety students as they work on that area. And again, that's going to require some training. We're fortunate we have some teachers, actually, that were formerly law enforcement or fire safety individuals. The green technology is a lot of science, mm -hmm. so that would fit, fit perfectly. In case you're bored, this would be a great program to join. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have about six, seven minutes. John, can you be able to? So our next presentation is, is cash balance review, and, and uh, John Hutchison is going to speed through that as quickly as he can. Trying to figure out what I did wrong to have to follow great presentations like that with a discussion of cash balances, but I'll do it in five minutes. Uh, historically, you all know that December is the most critical month for school districts uh, with regards to cash flow. So I just wanted to give you an update on where we're at and, and uh, discuss a little bit some of the dialogue going around 
uh, the state regarding cash balances. If you were to look at our treasurer's report for this evening, on the surface, it appears that as of December 31st of 2014, we have $161.6 million in cash balance. However, you also know that a large portion of that is not available for our use uh, for mid-year cash flow. Historically, we've always uh, grouped our funds uh, based on the restrictions around the expenditure. And the list of funds that you see here, we traditionally call our operating dependent funds. Uh, they're, they're dependent on the state funding formula for funds. But the reality is there is actually another group of funds that while um, you have, they have restrictions on how they can be spent, they are, you are allowed to utilize their balance throughout the year to help with cash flow. So this evening, I want to do my analysis, so I'm not accused of being uh, overreactive or anything, that, and be completely transparent about every dime that we could possibly use to meet cash flow mid-year in a school district is represented. If you forget about those funds you just saw, the other funds make up 88% of our fund balance, but they are uh, constitutionally or, or uh, statutorily restricted. You, you cannot touch the funds, uh, it would be a violation of law. So the 18 funds that appeared on the other slides make up only 12% of our fund balances. And in our case, that 12% really equates to about $13 million. So we had the flexible funds that we could use to help with cash flow at the end of December was $13 million. That equates to something called cash days, 15 cash days. What's a, what's a day's cash? A day's cash is you take your full budget, divide it by 365, and for us, that's about $830,000 a day we need. That's the size of our district. And you divide that balance and you say, you know what, if all revenue stopped, we can survive two weeks. Now, the good news is that is actually up from nine days last year. And the reason it's up is not uh, that we had a windfall of money. It has to do with the 20 mills that is levied across the state. It's being collected differently this year. It used to come straight to us. It was deducted off the total the state had to give us throughout the year for uh, state aid. But now it goes to the state and they have to give all of it to us but they didn't change the percentage we get each month. And so we, can't, we have benefited by about $6 million more by the time we got to December that the state had to pay out to us, even though those taxes haven't been collected till January. If you wanna look at it from the old standpoint of operating dependent, we would only have money in one fund. That's the contingency reserve. There's about $6.1 million there, and that's seven days cash if you would try to do a comparison going back. That, the, that reserve represents about 4% of our operating budget. And if you look at the operating, um, the, the reserves at the end of the fiscal year, June of, uh, of uh, 14, we were at about 6.5%. That's 1% below what the state is required statutorily to maintain. So even though it, it, it feels good at 6.5, the state is required to have a higher reserve, but we're sometimes criticized for having cash balances. Yes, sir. Mr. Hutchinson, last year, didn't we have $9 million in the McKinsey Reserve? Uh, at, at the end of December, uh, last year, if you recall, we went down to about $18 left in the contingency reserve. This year, we went into about $3 million, so there's $6 million left. So, so basically, you said that the, at, as of 1231, we'd use $3 million of our reserves? Correct. As cash flow. Cash flow. Because it'll be back to $9 million when we finish. Let's take a quick uh, look at some of the issues going around the, uh, the state and, and try to um, uh, kind of get, get at the facts. We continue to read of um, legislators, advocacy groups, and others that believe that perhaps our cash balances should be swept, that if we don't use the funds, we should give them back to the state. It kind of flies in the face of some of the moves that the legislature has made, though. About four years ago, we used to have a, a requirement that we couldn't exceed 6% in the contingency reserve. The legislature moved that to 10%. Then in 2012, they removed the cap altogether. So we're in a way, we were um, encouraged to uh, plan ahead with cash flow uh, and build balances for cash flow, yet, yet now there are discussions about sweeping. The state has the ability to borrow from other funds. Uh, You've read in the paper that in order to plug a budget shortfall, uh, we would borrow from CAPERS, or perhaps there'd be a borrowing from the highway fund. That 88% that's sitting there, we can't borrow from that. I go to jail if I, if I tap into that uh, in order to, to meet cash flow. Cash balances 
Uh, we read also, um, there's been a study across the state, and, and it's true, cash balances are up among all the school districts in the state of Kansas. However, as a percentage of their expenditures, they decline for the third year in a row. So as we all grow bigger, we're gonna spend more, we're gonna raise our balances to keep pace, yet when you divide that by our expenditures, um, it has actually decreased. If we were to reduce our balances or they were to be swept, it really does not help the state's cash flow either. We would be requesting money earlier because we would not have um, feeder money or seed money to begin our fiscal years, which is gonna put an undue burden uh, on the state system as well. Cash has a lot of, uh, a variety of reasons um, why we need it, and as any good business does. I know many of you run your own businesses or are in charge of businesses, and you wouldn't think of operating them without having some cash in reserve. Sometimes it's needed for long-term planning. We do not raise enough money to do a large textbook adoption. We have to do that over multiple years, build a balance, do the adoption. Cash is also needed to suppress fears of um, rescissions. Like any prudent business, we plan ahead for uh, cash flows and rainy days, and basically we've had a, a typhoon for the last six years. We, we have to keep reserves because we never we never know if there's gonna be a rescission mid-year, uh, and so that's just uh, good prudent planning to do that. We have to cover timing issues. It's not a, per, it's not a perfect, we raise $100, spend $100. We start uh, teacher contracts in August, and our main source of revenue is property taxes, whether it's coming through a formula or directly with us, those are not collected till December and distributed till January. Other times we get the money first and then spend it. But uh, those, those balances are there in order to um, handle our uh, cash flow. And uh, finally, cash we need uh, cash to maintain stewardship. I said it's okay to utilize some of additional funds to cover cash flow like driver's ed, but it doesn't make sense to sweep a driver's ed fund. A fee that we've charged locally for our students hand it off to the state. It makes more sense to keep it in the balance where it can either keep from having uh, uh, increase in fees or even decrease the fees the next year if we've collected too much. One final uh, comment about the balances. I just want the board to be aware. Um, although we gained uh, balance because of the way the 20 mills is collected as of December, I requested an additional $5 million from the state in January as an insurance policy, so to speak. We're not sure of the timing of how quickly with the 20 mills being collected, how quick it's going to get to the state and come back to us in our, in our uh, payments in January. I did not want to get caught in January, even though we have $13 million. Each a month's payroll is $16 million, and our AP loan is about $6 million. As I said, we only have about two weeks worth. I want to make sure that that uh, payment comes from the state in a timely enough manner. We do have that vehicle where we're allowed to um, make an appeal for additional funds. It's basically coming early. We'll, it'll, they'll take it from our next one, but I just want to make sure we have it. I don't believe we'll need it, but I wanted the uh, insurance, and, and we'll see. I want to make sure that January is not the new December, that January is the critical month because of the, new, the changes in how the bills are collected. With that, I'd take any questions. How'd I do on time, Mr. Schumer? You did fine. Okay. 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's because Mr. Parker interrupted him. Uh, you know, John, one of the things that you mentioned, you've got 15 days worth of reserve. I mean, that, honestly, if you think about it, generally, that's not a lot. You know, most businesses don't run on just 15 days. Most households don't run on 15 days. Um, and that's the one thing that we've got to be cautious about, again, because of all the things that are happening in the legislature and kind of tightening it down and looking at this. I mean, that, well, it's a big number, and I think that's where it is. People take a look at this. That's, that's a big, well, it is. But not compared to the money that we go through on a monthly basis. And so I um, appreciate everything that you do. Some of these formulas and how all this is calculated and how all this is, is watched is, is, is a challenge. So I want to thank you for everything that you do with that and, and keeping us informed and helping educate us on why it's important to be able to keep those reserves and, and what we're going to make in order to retain them and, and keep them. Any other questions? All right, so it's uh, 10 till 7, time for a couple break. You're doing things right, right, Dr. Barry? <laughs> okay, you can There's sure you keep me on there. track. There's cake to be eaten. Okay, there is cake out in the lobby. I saw, is that something to do with School Board Appreciation Month or something? That's it. That's it. <laughs>
So enjoy yourself. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll be back in here at seven o'clock. Thank you. And with that, Dr. Berry has uh, final recognitions for us this evening. As educators working for the district, we follow the education news, we keep up with legislative challenges, we read articles and books, we attend meetings and more. We are passionate and interested because we care and because it's our job. Our board members follow the education news, keep up with legislative challenges, read articles and books, attend meetings, and more. They do it because they are passionate, they care, and they are interested in the education of students in our community. But it's their second job, as they all have full-time day jobs. We always kind of joke about the check being in the mail, or there's a new policy for doubling the pay of board members. <laughs> But their pay is in the satisfaction that they feel in helping students to grow and achieve in our district. Board members are at the forefront of our district's efforts to prepare our kids for their future. The board members sitting here tonight have recently helped to open a new elementary school, are building a new high school for future high school students, have provided iPads to our elementary students, have provided up-to-date resources and textbooks for students to use, and the list goes on and on. Being a board member steals time away from their jobs, from their spouses, from their families, from their other interests that they have and would like to have. Board members share in the joy of student successes in our classrooms and on our playing fields and courts. They share in our sorrow of student death, illnesses, staff challenges, and more. This is Board Appreciation Month, and the governor has signed a proclamation calling upon all citizens to join in recognizing the dedication and commitment of local school board members. We should really do this every month. On behalf of the almost 30,000 students in our district, almost 5,000 employees in a community of 130,000, we thank you for your service to our community as a board member. Thank you very much. Check in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mary. Appreciate that. All right. At each regular meeting, the Board of Education reserves limited time for individuals wishing to address the board. We request that individual speakers limit their comments to five minutes. The clerk will monitor the time and notify the speaker when the five minute time limit has expired. Please direct your comments to the entire board. If a response is appropriate, the president will respond or refer to another individual. In an effort to respect privacy, we ask that speakers refrain from discussing personal complaints involving individual staff members or students. Those speaking are advised that public comments are videotape recorded for broadcast on the district's educational access channel and audio tape recorded as a matter of public record. Individuals addressing the board should come to the podium at the front of the room State your name and your address. Now we do have one pre-registered, uh, Mike Round. Is he here? Please come forward, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Round and I live at 13234 Long Street in Overland Park. And I'd like to talk about the results of a recent survey by the National Association of School Boards regarding the federal school lunch program. 84% of schools saw an increase in plate waste. 82% of schools saw an increase in costs. 77% of schools saw a decrease in student participation in the program. 
The irony of these devastating figures is they were released as the association celebrated National School Lunch Week. This was at the end of last year. There's nothing to celebrate here. With food quality falling, students going hungry, food being wasted, and costs rising, the association's solution was to beg Congress and the Department of Agriculture for flexibility. The federal budget in December gave their response. It isn't gonna happen. There might be some sodium requirements that will be lessened eventually, but in general, the program is here to stay. I've used the word federal several times because this is a federal program, though it is voluntary. Many students have opted, or many districts have opted out, but given the survey figures above, one would expect many more to say good riddance to this program. So why haven't they? Because it's voluntary in name only. When a district opts out, they forfeit money designated for free and reduced lunches. For some districts, that's not a lot of money, and the decision is easy. To others, it's a lot of money. For us, it's about $5 million a year and 30% of the student population. For $5 million in cost, I'd expect $5 million at least in value. As the survey showed, it's not even close. And the tragic thing is, the 30% of the students this program is supposed to be helping, they're getting bad food and throwing a lot of it away. And so are the 70% of students unaffected by the program. By accepting this money and the strings attached, we've abdicated control to the federal government. And it's not supposed to be that way. The school board association called the survey results unintended consequences of this federal school lunch program. To me, that's nonsense. Because when there's a direct cause effect link between an action and a consequence of that action, the consequences are either intended or the policy itself is flawed. All of this makes the job of food services, the hardworking people who are trying to do a good job, impossible. To me, they're being asked to spin straw into gold or to make bricks without straw, and it isn't gonna happen. Now, I don't know if we participated in, in that NESB, NASB survey, but I've seen pictures, heard stories of the lunches, I think we all have, not just on the internet, but from our own cafeterias. It's not that good, but it could be good. Let's give serious consideration to cutting ties with this federal program and in the process of providing good food to all students, also restoring local control. This is what our federal system is all about. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Appreciate that. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board tonight? Okay, great. Seeing none, we'll move forward. We're up to the uh, consent items. Is there anyone in particular that anybody needs to have any questions about or do I have a motion to move forward on all these? I would I'd have to, we'll go ahead. Go ahead. I have to pull up 510 legislative position. We'll pull that one out, okay. Any other ones? And do I have a motion to cover 501 through 509 and 511? I move to approve consent agenda items numbered 5.01 through 5.09 and 5.11 as presented. Second. So I have a first by Dr. Daniels and the second by Mr. Poland. Roll call, please. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Great. So 5.10, uh, legislative positions. Um, I suspect I guess, that you have some comments with I that? Just, I just wanted to clarify a position there as far as the, uh, the date of we supporting the elections to be held in uh, April. I. Since I publicly opposed that uh, to the legislature last year, I just wanted to basically uh, um, go on public of stating that I still you know, feel the way that I felt uh, publicly last year, the fact that, uh, that I think we are uh, doing a disservice to our voters uh, having an election at a time when we know that nobody's gonna show up for the election. Uh, if you look at the numbers, the, the difference in the numbers that people show up for fall elections versus spring elections, it's, it's uh, staggering. And uh, I think the, the same people uh, that, you know, we 
that are supporting our school districts, we ought to find a way, if being a data-driven student uh, district, if we looked at that data, we wouldn't sure wouldn't support the elections if we analyzed the data of uh, how many people attend the elections in spring versus fall. So I just, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for the legislative positions, but I just wanted to publicly clarify my position on that so that I don't feel uh, hypocritical when I speak later. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Paul. So I would move to accept uh, 5.10-2015 legislative positions. Second. All right. So I have a motion by Mr. Poland for 5.10 on the 2015 legislative positions and a second by Mr. McKeon. Roll call, please. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McKeon? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. We're good. All right, now we'll move on the action bids, contracts, and agreements. We only have two of these out here. So we got 6.01 digital projector and peripheral hardware bid. Do I have any comments, questions? Look for a motion then. Seeing that I would uh, move to approve 6.01 to approve the technology bid for digital projectors and replacement of HD equipment as presented. You want O2 as well? And 6.02, motion to approve white copy paper bid to replenish the district's supply of copy paper in preparation for spring order for film up with a minimum of four truckloads and a max of seven with pricing held firm through March of 2015 as presented. Second. So we're going to do a twofer here. We got 6.01, 6.02. We have a motion by Mr. McCune and a second by Mrs. Martin. Roll call. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. McKeon? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Very good. All right, future action items. Any questions, comments, concerns about any of the future action items? Seeing none, we'll move forward then. Um, information written, any questions about uh, the Head Start Director monthly report or construction change? We're rolling along. All right. Topics for discussion. Any of the board members have any uh, topics they'd like to bring up for discussion that are not on the agenda? I guess it's back to you, Dr. Barry, now for your comments. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with the weather. Um, I want to say thank you to the parents, students, staff, and others who are understanding about the fact that it's cold in Kansas in winter. There is no magic number for us when we put this together, so I want to explain that a little bit. It's a combination of the elements when we decide whether to have school or not. Snow on the ground, for instance, the past couple of days might have impacted the decision. We look at wind chill, actual temperature, whether the buses start, et cetera, they all plays a part into that. When we cancel school, we disrupt the work plans and childcare plans for parents across the district. When we hold school, some students have to deal with walking in the cold, cold, cold temperatures. We try to consider all areas of town, all schools, all methods of getting to school. Just recently, part of a coalition was in the office speaking with one of our staff members that the district's been working with, and they confirmed that many times the best place for kids on these days is in school. It's warm, they get their breakfast, they get their lunch, and it's by the way, a lot of good learning goes on. But it's a difficult decision, and, and uh, trying to, to uh, recover and be a little light about it. Uh, I don't read the, some of the social media because I don't think I could, could uh, stand up to that, but uh, someone shared a tweet with me from an Olathe South student. Um, as you know, uh, our principal is usually out front directing traffic, and so the tweet said, if we go to school, Phil will freeze. And the hashtag... <laughs> The hashtag, the hashtag was save Phil. <laughs> so optimistically, somebody said the other day, we're one day closer to spring break. I'm still in the, the mood, uh, unfortunately, that we have a lot of winter to go. So again, we'll continue to try to make the best decision we can. <laughs> Most of you are aware that on, at noon on December 30th, the court case uh, dealing with school finance in Kansas was the uh, last ruling was announced. Um, we're not going to get too excited about sharing too much yet. There's a lot of things that you can read, but we know it's going to be appealed. And so we are still, uh, as much as the end of this uh, calendar year at least, before we might know something. The, the court was very careful to say, not give a number in terms of what base state aid per pupil, what the number should be. 
They did talk a lot about what the number had been and what it would be if we'd kept up with inflation and, and those kinds of things, but they didn't come out and say, here's the number. Uh, they also did pick up a lot and share about the dependence that we're getting in our formula on the local option budget. And as you know, we're a district that uh, has put before our voters, and we, we put the extra 2% to go to 33% of our general fund uh, of LOB. And, and so we're, again, the, the fear I think is in Kansas, we are separating some districts from the others by doing more locally and how that impacts uh, the responsibility overall of the state. Uh, so again, that's got a real implication. Um, they also talked, the court stressed that the continuity and stability of funding is important for institutional planning, and we couldn't agree with them more. Uh, that, that, again, consistency for us to know what's happening from year to year uh, is, is uh, very important to us. So we'll kind of keep watching and, and see what happens through the appeal. Also want to mention something else uh, in Topeka, that the K-12 Efficiency and Performance Commission wrapped up their work officially this week in Topeka on Tuesday. They are still to, uh, to submit to the legislature a formal report, so we'll get a copy of that when it comes out. One of the things that they talked about Tuesday and confirmed is that they're gonna require all school districts to have an annual compliance audit. Uh, again, we get audited several times. Uh, they finally stuck in that it should be paid for by the state, so it's not an unfunded mandate. So we'll see how that, that works out. It may not come about because of that. Uh, the commission also, uh, talked a little bit about the unencumbered balances, which is why I wanted John to make sure we talked about it publicly uh, uh, tonight just a little bit. The commission on unfunded ba or, uh, on the balances said we should consider what good practices, business practices are. And, and to me, that almost still states it's a local control for us to determine what some of that might be. So anyway, we'll, there a report will be forward, forwarded to the legislature for consideration. We'll kind of watch that for everybody. I'd like to call your attention to your calendars. Um, we are slated to host the next uh, full meeting with the city council, the mayor, the city manager, and their staff. It's our turn to host, uh, and we're looking at February 19th. And so uh, you might take a look at that, and if it's a problem, let Joy know, and then we can kind of regroup. Uh, we will host it probably here, or we could go to the tech building uh, and, and host them there and give a little tour if we wanted to as well. But uh, please look at February 19th for that. Some really exciting news uh, to share is that we finished up our uh, Pennies for Shoes campaign as part of the Olathe Mayor's Christmas Tree Fund. Uh, again, want to thank Aaron Dugan for the organization of that on behalf of that group with the help of principals and a lot of others. But we have raised, our kids have raised over $22,000, which is more than $4,000 uh, over the, the amount that they raised last year. So really incredible that our kids and schools come together. A lot of fun stories in terms of how it was collected in stories of individual kids, uh, but a lot of engagement that happened in our schools, and uh, a lot of our kids uh, in those totals will be recognized at a future city meeting. Um, I want to introduce somebody who's in the audience tonight, new to our staff. We've talked in the past about how sometimes we utilize construction funds to, to help with some of our projects, and we've taken the stance that we can uh, be more efficient with that and, and have better services maybe if we have somebody additionally on staff. And so tonight, uh, a new member of the USD team is Travis Prolanges. Travis, if you'd stand. Uh, Travis uh, comes to us from an architectural firm uh, here in Kansas City, uh, uh, Kansas City and Topeka offices, but we are thrilled to have him on board to be working with Greg. Uh, Travis is actually a resident and a parent uh, in our school district, so that's even all the sweeter that uh, he's a part of our team now. So welcome, Travis. And the last comment I want to make is I want to make sure that this part does not become a regular part of my comments at board meetings, uh, and that's the announcing of a retirement by central office administrators. We had Dr. Letcher, and then last month we had Lou Ann. We also had and, and uh, didn't get a chance to talk about uh, Kathy Musgrave. Kathy is with us tonight, but she has also submitted her retirement and has done an outstanding job for us. <coughs> Uh, in terms of her leadership at the Advanced Technical Center and with some of our career in 21st century programs. We're gonna miss her greatly. Um, tonight, uh, we, you accepted in, in the uh, HR report the retirement of Jim Payne as the Executive Director of HR. And um, we're gonna miss Jim greatly. I'm gonna miss Jim. Uh, he actually had an entire career before he came to our school district. Um, but he lives here. His kids went to school here. And I want to thank Jim Payne for sharing his skills here for the past five years. And uh, thank you, Jim, for that. With that, uh, I don't have anything else. Okay. 
So we will need an executive session. And you need how much time? 15? 15 minutes? And then we probably need 20 minutes, so. Move the board adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non elected personnel and discussing matters related to employer employee negotiations. And the board return to the regular meeting at how long do you say? I'll go 13 and we'll just do 8 o'clock. Is that all right? 8 o'clock. Okay. Return to the regular meeting at 8 o'clock in this room. The executive session is required in order to protect the privacy interests of the individuals to be discussed and to protect the district's right to the confidentiality of its negotiating position and the public interest. Second. Roll call, please. Dr. Daniels, second? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Martin? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yeah. Mr. McCune? Yes. 